hello and welcome to our benefice on, on to our online benefice service today my name is Debbie Pow and I'm associate priest at St Mary's Chalcombe and St Stephen's Lansdowne I'm also uh, a farmer's wife and I've come to one of our uh, wheat fields uh, for today's service Apologies that the glasses are a bit dark at the moment. The sun came out for a moment and um, uh, and those react like glasses that sends them very dark. So <laughs> apologies for that. They may well lighten up as the, the clouds come over. Uh, apologies too that it's uh, I'm recording this uh, in the middle of a working farm. Uh, I've come to the middle of a field to try and be as quiet as possible, but there may be background noises uh, as well. Uh, and my kitten has uh, followed me right out into the middle of the field. He may well pounce on me uh, at some point during the recording. I apologise if he does that. I, I particularly wanted to come out into the field today because uh, we're thinking still about Jesus as the bread of life. And I've come out into uh, one of our wheat fields. Uh, this is a variety called Skyfall, which is uh, a bread making wheat. So it's very appropriate that I'm sitting here. Uh, and apologies for my microphone standing in the, right in the middle of the shot. Uh, usually I have try and have it out of shot, but today, uh, because I'm squished sitting in a, a, a tram line, trying not to disturb the crop, uh, it's in full view. So apologies for all those things. But just uh, may we add those to our worship. This is a very simple service. Uh, there's no liturgy. Uh, it contains the readings that will be in our churches and my sermon that I will preach. Let's just begin by having a pause and then I'll lead us in a beautiful prayer, uh, just of preparation before we begin. Beloved one, let me be aware of you, with me and within me. Let me attend to each part of my body, all that is well and all that is poorly. Help me to let go of all in my life that lies in shadow, what I've done what I've said and what I've thought, all that's not helpful, that dishonours and mars your image in me. Have mercy on me. Let me trust your presence as I listen. Let me not be distracted by the clamour of every thought but let my heart be still, my mind unlearned, my face unmasked. Let me not be afraid of all that I know I cannot be, but let me trust that I am enough. That just to be here is enough, just as I am and to trust that you look on me, my beloved, with eyes that see and eyes that love, for you are love itself. Amen. And a prayer for today. Divine love undaunted by death and fear, who went to the depths to bring back life in the power of the cross, shape a people of service, breaking bread for a hungering world through Jesus Christ, the true food. Amen. Yeah, sit down. Our first reading comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, 
chapter 5, beginning at verse 15. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Gospel reading comes from John's Gospel, chapter 6. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us flesh to his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, there you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is the true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. I wonder if when you've been ill, what your comfort food is, what is it that you reach for when you start to feel better? For myself and my sister uh, growing up uh, it was almost it was always toast and marmite and marmite is supposed to be one of those love hate uh, things that you either love it or you hate it now, i'm not a marmite baby like my sister or my daughter but i don't dislike it and it has its place almost in the medicine cabinet to be honest now john's gospel I always find it's a, it's a little bit like Marmite. Some people absolutely love his imagery. And for many, his gospel has been a gateway to faith. But for others, myself included, uh, it's much more difficult to understand. Those of us who like a, a, a very literal cause and effect, almost chronological style, John's imagery is, 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 a, is a struggle. It's as if he's talking in riddles. And yet there's also a depth to John's gospel that makes it really worth grappling with. Take today's passage. We've been hearing Jesus say that he is the bread of life. In fact, that's a theme we've had for the last couple of weeks. Andrew preached brilliantly on it last week and Philip the week before. If you haven't seen those sermons, do check, uh, do follow, do look at them out. And we're hearing yet again Jesus' emphasis that he is the bread of life. Why? Why the emphasis? Now, Jesus has been taking his listeners on a journey. It began with his miraculous feeding of the 5,000. Jesus starts where people are and for them 
that uh, physical need was where they were at, that hunger, physical hunger. And he spoke to them of who he was through that miracle. But he moves on from there and starts developing the theme, feeding their minds and their souls too. And in the process, showing and demonstrating that he is the Messiah, the promised saviour. We have to remember when we listen to or read John's Gospel that to Jesus' uh, listeners, they were mostly of Jewish background. And one of the pinnacles of the, their uh, cultural journey with God, their relationship with God, was when they were in the wilderness uh, after God had rescued them uh, from slavery in Egypt through Moses. And there were hundreds of thousands of them in, in the wilderness, in a really desolate place where food wasn't abundant. And each day, God fed them. These sweet crumb-like things appeared on the ground each morning. They called it manna from heaven. And they understood that as coming from God. But they weren't content just with the manna. They wanted meat too. And lo and behold, flocks of quail appeared each evening. And so they had meat to eat too. God's provision for his people had stayed with them in their cultural, uh, in, in their collective memory. So Jesus picks up on that understanding when he points to himself as being the source of that manna, as being a part of God, as being uh, the saviour, as the being the provider of their needs. But there's more to it than just that. Jesus, as the bread of life, as he points out, the bread that he gave for the life of the whole world is his flesh. He's pointing to his death on the cross. But Jesus doesn't end just with eating, about eating his body, eating bread, him being the bread of life. He then tells them that they must not only eat his body, but they must drink his blood. Now, we talk about that all the time in the church. It's in our liturgy, especially for communion. Uh, we just talk about it, mention it, don't think about it. But to Jesus' uh, first century listeners, his original listeners, that was the most disgusting thing they've probably ever heard. Blood was not even allowed to be in the meat. An animal had to be bled uh, to, uh, as it died rather than uh, so that there was no blood in the meat. In their understanding blood contained the very source of life. It's why they splattered it on the altars. Blood had such a significance. It was life in itself. Of course we have a very different understanding now although we know the need of blood. So what did Jesus mean by eating his flesh and drinking his, his blood? How are we to understand that? As I've said, Jesus implied and, and showed that his life was given uh, for all the world. And yet he also talks about the way we need to consume him, just as we consume bread. And just as the constituents of bread become uh, assimilated into us, they, they become, uh, they, they steep, seep into our cells and become very, very part of the whole of us. And so that is for Jesus and for, uh, for, for him. You know, as a farmer, as I said, a farmer's wife, we're involved in the production of bread. But at least in the wheat that makes the bread. 
Wheat takes nearly a whole year to grow and to get to this ripened stage. This, as I said, is ready for harvest uh, when it stops raining. And, um, but it, it, in September, by the end of September, we'll be planting next year's crop. So it's in the ground for at least 10 months of the year. And over the last few years, I've also been a bread maker. Uh, I make sourdough bread each week. That is the same sort of bread that uh, Jesus would, uh, would have been around in Jesus' day. And it took time. It takes at least a day, if not two, to make sourdough. Bread needs time. Dallas Willard, who is a philosopher at the was a philosopher at the University of Southern California, has sadly died now. He um, was one of those wonderful, godly men. He was known outside of academia uh, for his uh, as a teacher of the way of Jesus, as a teacher of discipleship and a follower. Um, and. He was asked by a, a, a well-known preacher of a la of large church, a huge church in, in America. What was the secret? You know, this chap John who, are, who, who spoke to him, he's a writer of many books and you would expect him to, to really know what it means to follow Jesus and assimilate him. And, and he asked Dallas, what is it? What is the secret? What is it that I need to do if I'm to be the person that I really want to be, to grow in Christ-likeness? And Dallas, as apparently was his way, took a long pause. And then he just said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry in your life. This is some of, the, of God's wisdom that Paul talked about to the Ephesians. The world tells us to be busy. It's all about productivity. Work hard and enjoy your leisure. Do you notice that adverts are always about leisure? It's what we crave. But leisure takes up the rhythm of the world and becomes ever more frenetic. And all that busyness is wonderful, but it comes at a cost. When we're busy, we don't have time for family and friends. We get ratty with those that are close to us, those we love the most. We don't have time to stand still, to stare, to smell the flowers, to wonder at the marvel of God's creation. We cut Jesus out because we don't have time for him. So we can't assimilate his love, his peace and his presence into our being. One of the things that people have appreciated most from the first lockdown was the space and the slowing down. Yet we've learned to speed up again. We've learned other ways of being busy. And I'm preaching as much to myself as I am to the rest, to everyone else. I'm one of those people who tends to be a little bit task focused. There's never quite enough hours in the day for all that I want to do. You may not live like that, but many do. Ask most people how they are, and, and you'll often get the answer, I'm fine, but busy. It's almost like it's a badge of honour. It's a uh, it, sense of importance in our culture. But it's not the way of Jesus. It's not the wisdom of God. I'm reading a book at the moment by a former mega church 
a pastor chap by the name of John Mark Comer, whom I've heard speak, and he's a brilliant Bible teacher. Um, but he worked out that he was talking about Jesus, but his life just wasn't matching up with what he was talking about. And it, he was he was exhausted and uh, not a little bit frayed at the edges. And his book is called The Ruthless Elimination of Harry, inspired by those words from Dallas Willard and based on what he's discovered. Now, it's not an academic book by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, it's got a very casual style and it's quite American. Um, not everyone's taste, but he's got some real little gems there. And it's, it's made me uh, reevaluate some of the things I do. Uh, it's made me just question some of the habits I've got into. So I've started, started turning off my phone sometimes. I'm making sure that I have my quiet time with God and I need at least half an hour each day. Everyone's different, not everyone will need that length of time, but I do. And I'm making sure that I get that now. And I'm trying to reinstate a Sabbath rest. Not just a day off of work to catch up on the home chores, but a day of rest. A day to marvel at God's creation, a day to worship him, a day for leisurely meals with family and friends, a day for rest, for perhaps doing those things that make my soul sing, that fill me with joy, things that are definitely not on my to-do list. And I'm finding that hard, but of all of the, all those things are beginning to make a difference beginning to bring back that sense of peace and calm from Jesus. So I wonder what for you is the way that Jesus needs to feed you? Is it eliminating some of the hurry, perhaps changing something in your lifestyle? Or if you're someone with time, is it making that time to spend with Jesus. I hope you're not feeding from him as a way of uh, recovering from illness, but that this is a life-giving part of your life. Amen. in the quiet and the stillness. Let's pray to our God as we worship him in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, we pray for all in your church and for those who you call to lead in your church. We pray for greater discernment of your presence and for your will in our Christian communities. Pray to you for a clearing away of all that obscures our vision. We pray especially at this time for our diocese as they discern who should be our next Bishop of Bath and Wells. Creator God, we pray against the cynicism and complacency that deaden wonder in the ordinary things of life. May we detect your love and wisdom through everyday events. May we encounter you walking alongside us. Jesus, bread of life. We pray for breadwinners and winemakers and for all food growers. We pray for your presence in kitchens, cafes, restaurants and bars.
wherever people gather to eat. May they find you there. Lord of all wisdom, we pray for learners and explorers. For those who've received A level and GCSEs grades this week. For those whose plans have been confirmed. And for those whose plans have changed. Open their eyes to new possibilities. and lead them into ways of flourishing. Healing Spirit, we pray for those whose emotions have been damaged, making trusting and receiving seem threatening and dangerous. Pray for peace of mind for the anxious. We pray for hope for all who are close to despair. Praying especially for those caught up in the shootings in Plymouth. For those living in Greece and Turkey and other parts of the world who fled fires. And for those in Afghanistan, seeing the Taliban move in, especially for the women and the girls. eternal God, we pray for those who've reached the boundary of death, that in faith they may journey through it and out into the unkind confined space and the joy of heaven. May they know your love enfolding them. Heavenly Father, we rejoice it that the ordinary things of this world are saturated with your extraordinary love. So merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we pray with confidence as Jesus, our Saviour, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen may the peace of christ go with you wherever you wherever he may lead you may he guide you through the wilderness protect you through the storm May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and those you love and those with no one to love, now and always. 
Amen.